Hello, I'm Dr. Ron Eaglin coming to you from Daytona State College, and this is CEN 3722, Human Computer Interaction. And today we're going to talk about computer supported cooperative work. This is going to be a field that you have seen before. We often call this simply groupware. And we're going to talk about some different groupware systems. I think most of you will have had some exposure to these types of groupware systems, but I want to make sure that everybody has at least a good understanding of groupware, especially in the field of HCI, because you're probably going to be designing something that's going to be used by multiple users. And as soon as you put this together so that they're being used at the same time by multiple users, you've essentially got a groupware system. So we're going to look at some of the existing groupware systems that are out there, but we're also going to look about what things you need to take into consideration in designing groupware systems and dealing with systems that are actually used by multiple people at the same time. So... Groupware, what is groupware? Well, groupware is anything where you've got multiple users using the same system at the same time. These may be systems that you don't necessarily think of as groupware. So for example, the registration system that you use to register for classes here at Daytona State College, if you're registering for classes, well, that is a groupware system because multiple people are using it at the same time. And the information that you're putting into the system by registering for classes is going to be used by another user, let's say the instructor, to form a class role. So it does make it an actual groupware system. It may not be something that you think of as a groupware system because you might be using things like uh, chat systems and, and conferencing systems as groupware, but it is. So there are a lot of different kinds of groupware systems. The point that we're gonna make out of this is that you've gonna have to deal with this concept of multiple users at the same time dealing with the systems in your interface designs. This is a very mature technology. It is used all over the place. So let's go into the basic definitions of groupware and let's look at the, 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 the simple same place, same time, okay, versus different place, different time. How does this classify? So if you're together, you're at the same place at the same time, and you may actually be using a computer system where you're literally sitting in the same room and we're all using it together, there are still groupwares to support that type of situation. If I'm in a classroom giving a PowerPoint slide to a group of live students, well, the PowerPoint itself is a form of groupware that I am using to control the meeting of those students. So same place, same time versus same place, different time. As soon as you move the temporal aspect away, you're now dealing with the concept of an asynchronous form of communication. We don't communicate at the same time. We may be at the same place, and we actually do this. If you've ever been anywhere in a hallway in any of the, of the uh, classrooms around here, you'll notice that there's bulletin boards. Those are actually asynchronous groupware systems. Okay, somebody posts up, I've got an apartment for rent, boom, sticks it on the board. You go by and you pull off the phone number that goes with that. Well, that was just a form of groupware right there. And it can be done electronically or not electronically. But that has the same place but a different time. You weren't there when the person posted the thing up. And what we do all the time in the classes that we teach where I maybe don't, you know, I recorded this now, but it's available to you at a different time and we're leaving messages for each other, that's also asynchronous. These are all methods of communication. They all have interfaces. They all work together. So the functions of grouper systems is communication and coordination. So when you're building a grouper system, you, if you do require these as the goals of the system, you need to take care of both of those. Grouper systems do need Necessary partners. Necessary partners are those people that actually have to work together to perform a task. And in building a system that actually is group-based, understanding those necessary tasks is, is important. Even the registration system and the necessary tasks are important. As people are registering for classes, we're also monitoring the registration system to see are we going to open up new sections of the class? Are we going to... So, so you do actually have that communication 
does have an effect on the users on the other end, even in those types of situations. So what are some of these? Um, I am giving a lecture or a demonstration, okay? I may do this live as a broadcast. I may do this live as a recording. Okay, these are, this, th this is actually a form of groupware. I may host a conference, and I like to host conferences. I use Skype, or I also use um, Google Hangouts a lot for that. The distribution of the time and the location. In this case, you're dealing with a conference. You're dealing with location. Okay, and there's lots of different forms for doing that. There is the good old telephone conference or something where you have a conference that um, requires the visual portion of that. Or you may actually have the telephone and a visual portion done separately. The concept of a directed conference is simply just adding a leader to the conference itself, having somebody who's in charge. Typically in a classroom scenario, or if I'm doing a classroom-based conference, I'd be the one in charge, and I would be directing the entire thing. Structured work processes, there are many types of structured work processes. Uh, that example of the um, registration versus me seeing the student role is a structured work process. Another structured work process may be the approval of a travel authorization or a purchase requisition where it goes from person to person. That is still a group or a system. All the principles of design, visibility, usability, all those use they all still are the same. And it is a group where because I can see when somebody else has approved something and I know how it's going through. These are all systems. Good news is this, is that you are very familiar, hopefully, with many of these types of, of systems. So um, we've done, the, uh, hopefully you've done the electronic classroom. Um, we typically here use Adobe Connect a lot for those types of classroom situations. Okay, you may be required to design systems like that for dealing with those types of situations. But when you're designing them, okay, the same design principles that we have beaten in every single lecture, they all, still, they all still apply. What does it mean? You've got to design for the user. You've got to have an understanding of the task. You've got to be able to make a system that people are going to use. And you've got to take into account all the various design considerations, different time zones, different languages, that you would have to do in any type of design. So one of the ones that I am going to point out, however, is the concept of size, because this is something that we actually have not dealt with or talked about in any of our other designs, because it's unique, to, it's unique partially in, in the use of groupware systems. So if I design a chat system, and I've got six people that are very active on the chat, that chat system works very well for a size, and that size may be anywhere from three, two, let's say to 10. But if you've got a live chat system and you've got 500 people participating, it's, it goes crazy. It doesn't work. So the number of users, now that doesn't mean you can't design something that can deal with 500 users. It just means that that standard chat system is not the way to do that. And so you do need to take into account this as you're working through this. Again, standard design, unpredictability, the concept that you may actually have resistance. Now, some grouper systems deal with the resistance that we're going to call, I'm going to call this political resistance. So political resistance is when somebody has a specific something that they're using as a power base. They have access to this information, or they have access to this system, it becomes a source of power for them. Politics is usually about the allocation of power. And in groupware systems, you're normally asking people to give up control of things that they may have actually had as part of their power base. So you need to be able to deal with that level of resistance that's gonna, that might come in in the introduction of grouper systems, or systems that are used by multiple users, because you are giving up information about 
in, in making, to make the collaborative environment. So um, benefit is also, and this is something we really haven't talked about a whole lot, the concept of the personal benefit. Acceptance of almost any type of HCI system is going to be much better if the users of that system actually have something that they gain as a personal benefit, not just a group benefit or not just an organizational benefit, but a, of, a, of a user. And yeah, it's sometimes challenging to figure out what is that personal. And the personal benefit may be that, wow, I'm able to accomplish this task in much less time, therefore I am able to do other things. In groupware, especially large-scale groupware or those types of things, you may actually have this compounded quite a bit. So cooperation, power structures, and also the invisible worker. Um, <laughs> in scenarios where, in groupware allows you to do things that you weren't able to do before. It allows you to create virtual offices. It allows you to have people working from home. You've got things that will change because of this new paradigm that you've actually introduced with the concept of the groupware, okay? And what does this mean? Well, you may have the invisible worker, and managers don't typically like the concept of the invisible worker. What that means is you're going to have a shift from time at a location to productivity as an employee. What does that mean to you as a designer? Well, guess what? If a manager is necessary for the acceptance of a system, and the manager was used to making sure that all the employees were in their offices at specific points in time, and now they have no way of measuring that, they're still going to want to have to have something that they can, as a manager, use. So a measure of levels of productivity may have to be introduced into the system to provide for this. So there are all sorts of issues that come together when you put together the ability and, and things that you can do with groupware. I only want to scratch the surface with what I want to do here because I can get in, you can get really deep into the weeds when you start dealing with how do you manage organizations based on the capabilities of technologies that you're introducing that allow for asynchronous or non-place bound scenarios. And I think all of us have seen this in the workplace. This is a total adaptation to new things. However, what we do want to understand is what is groupware? What is this capability of having collaborative work together? And what are some of the functions that you get out of groupware systems? But most important, okay, what effect do these have? And what things do you have to consider if you're designing systems as either groupware or cooperative work-based systems. And it's not just the design parameters, but it's also the political and other parameters. There's many other things that, that you now have to take into account as you're going into the design. There is always a way to solve the problem, and that's what I want to leave you with here. But solving the problem is usually comes from a good understanding of the problem. So Dr. Ron Eaglin signing out with CSCW, our computer-supported cooperative work from Daytona State College.